Uh, I think we have some time for questions. Um, and the floor is open as we sort of try and draw my attention. Maybe while people are collecting their thoughts, if I could kick off by uh, asking Dr. Subramanian. I was quite struck by uh, what you mentioned about the absence of any discussion here, or, or at least of a sort of significant level of discussion on sort of the things which are happening in sort of Asian economic space. Uh, I wonder how much of it is because of the fact that maybe the nature of the game itself is fundamentally changed. Right? With, with, with things like TPP, it's no longer the usual sort of negotiations about you know tariffs and so on, which is what typically your system is at least over the last 20 years so had to deal with. Uh, and then you're talking about a range of non-tariff barriers and then other kinds of standards which are coming into place. Uh, I mean, how much of it is simply because you know we are entering a completely new terrain of you know things uh, of trade negotiations and so on, or is it simply uh, that we just don't understand what's happening? Thank you, Shreya, for yeah, actually, it's like in this case, I don't think that is the issue because you know, if you look back over the last 10, 15 years, even the multilateral sphere, that, you know, uh, at Singapore and so on, the fact that the world has moved to so far behind the border barriers, that's really very, very old news. So I don't think it's because that, you know, some other, the object of discussion is, is no longer border barriers, but something like deeper, lots of domestic policy. I think even in the Uruguay document, services had to do a lot with regulation and, and things like that. So uh, and, uh, I, I think it's it's something other than that. What exactly I cannot pinpoint, but I think it's not because the the, the subject matter of negotiations has changed because that's actually quite old. <clears throat> uh, no, I just wanted to mention that. Um, um, I mean, there has been some work which has been uh, going on and, and uh, if you if you see some of the work which is coming out say from from the uh, think tank that i had um research and information system for, for developing countries we have actually over the last one and a half years brought out several publications drawing attention to what the implications of uh, tpp would be for india or what the implications of ttip would be uh, we have uh, done a very major study on ATEC, <coughs> and uh, there is a lot of focus today in government itself on uh, what we should be doing if we wish to become members of APEC, um, uh, what, what, what kind of structure it has and uh, what would be the uh, gains for India if we do become members. Uh, I think uh, we are also um, in, in the conversations that we are having, for example, with the United States only uh, yesterday we had uh, we had uh, a, a team from CSIS uh, here, and uh, we were basically talking about how uh, there is a very major asymmetry in in terms of uh, uh, the Joint Strategic Mission for Asia Pacific that has figured in uh, the Obama Obama Modi uh, Joint Statement when uh, President Obama was here, and uh, that uh, on the on the economic side and trade side, we seems to be on on like almost like an adversarial relationship, and you cannot really move forward with that uh, beyond a certain point. So I'm not sure that uh, it is true that uh, we do not have a focus on 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 these. Uh, developments and what they mean for India, not only in terms of the trade and economic issue, but also in the larger uh, strategic context, uh, what they mean. Uh, that should we should be talking about it more, I grant that. Uh, that we should be doing more, uh, this is precisely what uh, one has been trying to argue, that uh, we need to do much more about it than we have been able to do. But um, I think there is, there is uh, a focus on I doubt that I am going to have the time or the energy to read this marvelous book, uh, particularly as I gather it's too heavy to lift. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask whether there is enough in this book or it about the roots of Indian foreign policy, or if you like, the 
uh, roots of uh, the uh, of Nehru's world view, in particular about the Second World War. India arose, Indian <coughs> independence came out of the Second World War. And so it's uh, simply to, to refer to as Shankar has done about the uh, organizational impact of uh, the Dumbarton um, Oaks and um, uh, Britain Woods and so on, or uh, the British Legacy Act, which is normally simply a, a reiteration of what Sir Olaf Kerkero wrote about uh, our uh, no northern neighbors. Now, you see, uh, the impact of the Second World War on what, how uh, the uh, our foreign policy emerged, and is I think deserving of detailed analysis. This is a period which Srinath has studied, and I'm not sure that there is any article on this. But um, the, the the views that. Uh, Nehru uh, or the Indian establishment, if you like, developed on the attitude to the U.S., Britain, Russia, China, Japan, all were carryovers from the events of 1939-1945. I, I think I can explain what I mean by giving a simple example. In 1942, I was 18, a student in Bihar. And no doubt, to the nation, in the nationalist view, what was important was the uh, Fit India movement, which went on, and the Jafrakash Narayan's famous first letter, or second letter to the fighters for freedom. As far as I was concerned, as a, an individual, what mattered was that the world was changing. That the whole future of mankind depended on the outcome of what was going on. And in 1942, <coughs> what was important to me was that the Nazi war machine had occupied the whole of Europe from France to the East. The Japanese war machine had destroyed the, the British, British Empire in South Asia. And the, everything hinged on the, a titanic battle that was going on in outside Stalingrad. The uh, 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 Russian army had been pushed back <laughs> and uh, there was siege in Leningrad, in Moscow, and finally in Stalingrad. And in, in 1942, at that point, it didn't really matter whether the trips offer was accepted or not. It should have been, in my view. Oh, and <coughs> whether the, <laughs> the, what, where the, um, Netaji was at the time, or what he was doing. What really mattered simply was whether the uh, German war machine could be stirred, turned back from Stalingrad. It eventually was, after a year, of, almost a year of siege, and three battle groups of the, the Russians under Zhukov, Kurniev, and I forget the name, mm -hmm. Timoshenko, uh, uh, attacked and they pushed back the German war machine and there was a great battle in Kursk and that changed the whole future. Now, the, so the Nehru, who was a person who understood these things, he, he wasn't a simple uh, an Indian nationalist, he was a world figure. He would have like a simple student like myself, he would have felt 
and understood the impact of what was happening. So I, I just want so to, I think we need to uh, ask whether to get other people a chance. Whether to somebody, to whether there will be some study of the roots of uh, the real world view and foreign policy. There is actually a chapter on Abraham, I'm sure uh, Srinath is going to say more on history. And I think what he said is absolutely right, and I think uh, the point about that the pre-47 history, the particular interwar period, uh, the kind of moments that arose in India, their engagement with the world, uh, it was not going to be possible to capture all of that. And I think that's partly the work which I was referring to that others need to do in the coming years. But with Nehru, there's a separate chapter. On the Raj, there was a separate chapter. But as I said, uh, that work, pre-47 work, the interwar period, uh, that needs to be uh, explored in a much, much deeper way. I think we have a question. Uh, so I'm still a student, and I've got two questions just to learn from all of you. Um, how do you manage to condense the pluralistic nature of international relations, even in such an elaborate textbook? What is the academic methodology that can be used? That's the first set of question. And the second question will be, is that uh, like grandeurism was a philosophy that was consciously used in France uh, for the foreign policy and even for the domestic policy. Do you think that India has such an underlying philosophy, sustainable underlying philosophy that shapes up who we are today as a country? And that would be it. Anybody of you could answer, or all of you could answer with different perspectives. Uh, and that's the last point. Well, I'm afraid I, I can't answer the question about the uh, uh, methodology or the academic uh, discipline that you refer. Raja, you can answer that. If you're asking me whether we have a conceptual framework regarding the future of India and how we can achieve it with foreign policy initiatives or practices, I wish I could say yes. Uh, there are glimmerings and there are, what should I say, avenues being touched upon here and there. Uh, but to be honest, you know, I suppose you're referring to de Gaulle's famous remark in his memoirs that France cannot be France without grandeur. I believe that's very true of India, much more true of India. I don't think India can be India without grandeur or greatness is, good, is the more correct translation. <coughs> But whether there are enough political forces or administrative agencies in this country that have any practical sense of what greatness means. It's greatness is above all of concepts. I'm not sure how widespread you can expect that to be if you look at the political scene of India today. So I would say that the need for some such framework is there, but I would be very glad to know if some of you younger people are developing it, because our generation didn't. Just as Bakri, since Nehru is the central idea and fulcrum of the entire episode, does the book reflect he has been the first foreign minister of India and lifelong foreign minister of India. Does the book carry the imprint of Nehru's philosophy, ideas, ideologies, and his anglophile outlook in the book? And foreign policy was quite attuned to more to the Indian needs. Or did it also carry his uh, British outlook? Because Punch in 1949 or 50 wrote that responsible circles in England are of the opinion that Nehru will go down in Indian history as the last British Viceroy of India. That's how the authors have taken this first, first foreign minister of India. Yeah, I mean, so there is a chapter on Nehru and uh, I think it's an interesting chapter because it, it tries to break some of the traditional dichotomies within which Nehru sort of viewed. Uh, but beyond that, I think, yes, I mean, the, 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 the early period is, is given quite a lot of prominence. But but what I think we have managed to avoid uh, and which Ambassador Bajpai quite 
correctly alluded to right at the beginning was that there is a plurality of sort of approaches and views out here and uh, at least as editors i don't think we had any sort of uh, any particular interpretive line that we wanted to uh, showcase for the book so so what you would find is that uh, there may be sort of uh, differing perspectives from with various chapters itself on on certain kinds of questions and certainly i think as editors we did have different takes on the chapters when we were reading them uh, as well so so i think the plurality of the exercise was what was uh, of most important to us look i, I think because if you see the nature of the topics uh, of the 50 chapters and nehru figures everywhere and this because as the first foreign minister much of india's record uh, is tied to what he did so i mean there's nehru there's nehru there's nehru there's a lot of nehru uh, it, because as the principal uh, articulator of india's world view before independence for the indian national congress later as the first prime minister and as the first foreign minister till as you said life long uh, he he matters in, in in everything but the chapter i think tried to summarize the specific chapter in the text to summarize his world view uh, in the realist versus idealist uh, debate and i think it captures quite a bit of it yes there Uh, if you see the uh, sir, my question is very uh, simple. That uh, in the foreign policy means international treaties, the bilateral treaties, the unilateral. Now, as far as uh, India is two third of coastal belt, at coastal coast belt. Now, in the coastal belt, there is a continental shelf. and because of the continental shelf is very ambiguous we are always have a, a sort of a dispute between the fishermen and other problems so how far this continental shelf has been explained in the foreign policy sir uh, this is bit of a technical point so i would like mr sharan please get to go, go ahead <laughs> um we have actually been quite successful in um, in uh, uh, the demarcation of uh, international maritime i mean in mar maritime boundaries with uh, most of our neighboring countries but with pakistan of course there is a problem because of the uh, we have not been able to re uh, resolve the issue of the circle but uh, with respect to uh, the other uh, countries uh, with whom we share ocean space uh we already have a maritime uh, boundary now whether or not fishermen observe those uh, boundaries that's a different issue because uh, uh, they don't always uh, know where the uh, boundary lies uh, and similarly there are uh, many fishermen who come from other countries who fish in our uh, exclusive economic uh, zone uh, so that's a question of uh, surveillance that's a question of enforcement whether or not you have the uh, necessary means of enforcing uh, uh, where, what your what your maritime boundary is but in terms of uh, uh, actually drawing up the maritime uh, boundaries uh, actually with uh, the exception of uh, of uh, uh, pakistan we have in fact demarcated those boundaries with uh, our uh, neighboring countries i just want to uh, add i think uh, one of the areas i think which needs to be covered in future and i think uh, the international movement was led by lawyers uh, and many of them were deeply conscious of uh, uh, the need for a, a legally rooted post war order so when nehru keeps uh, in his first broadcast talks about one word one o and w in caps uh, he's saying look I mean, there was a notion of a legally constituted post war rule order based. Yeah, a rule based order and, and i think the fact that uh, article 51 the direct principles talks about why india ought to abide by international norms so i think that there is actually a whole story there of uh, of india and international law india's leading role in the drafting of the human rights convention about the sea the, yeah, so and, and the law of the space uh, that the indian lawyers played a big role uh, in in constructing i think that legal norms of course a lot of that eventually got into trouble with uh, ever say relative to kind of india so that's a different story but i think we need to do a lot more of that and i think even reconstructing the role of you know indian legal thinking uh, what it did to uh, uh, to the to the construction of the world order thing both before independence and and after uh, that's that's about that has been done so but there's no chapter on law of the sea just right 
Uh, I think we'll sort of... Yeah, one, one last one. It is, okay, that, that's going to be the last question. Okay. Uh, so it's projected that by 2050, uh, uh, the world will be short of around 50 million working individuals. And India alone will have around 45 million uh, surplus working individuals. Do you think something like that would create a room for uh, Indian foreign policy to create an influence on the foreign policies of other countries? I think Dr. Subramanian should. <laughs> and maybe also link it to this whole question of labor mobility and G20. And other things. <laughs> Firstly, I, I don't know where that uh, <clears throat> number comes from. I, you know, it's, it's a number that I'm not familiar with <clears throat> because... Uh, You know, the, the, if you believe the techno-optimist uh, view of the world, it, it looks like there'll be many, many more, uh, you know, surplus <laughs> labor than, uh, than 50 million. So, uh, I, I, so I don't know where that uh, number comes from, and I, I don't understand that number. Um, but, but I think, yeah, I, I think one of the uh, areas in which, you know, international integration has uh, perhaps prog advanced... Uh, least and you can see this now with the refugee crisis uh, everywhere that uh, uh, you know labor mobility and, and as economists we know that the gains to labor mobility now are by far much higher than the gains to you know mobility in trade or goods or even cap uh, factor flows uh, because labor mobility is so restricted at the moment. So it's like currently there's probably a 200 or a 300 percent effective tax on labor flows. And we know that when you have very high taxes, initially the gains are actually very, very high to bringing them down. Uh, and, and this is an area where we have a, a big interest. You know, We've pursued this in the WTO under what's called Mode 4, uh, not without uh, much success. Of course, we also try and push this bilaterally, with, especially with the U.S., because we're such a so there's such an asymmetry in trade. So I think this is certainly an, a very fruitful, productive, and important area of future international engagement for India. Yeah, okay. Just one, one final thought, and I think the, the question about Grandia was raised when I thought, uh, if you look at Nehru's, I mean, both the discovery of India uh, <coughs> and glimpses of world history, where he imagines uh, India as one of the six great powers that's going to run the world, which includes Russia, uh, China, Japan, uh, America, and uh, United Europe. So I think that notion that look, India had a great role to play in, in the world, and that was that was uh, runs through with the idea of Indian exceptionalism or manifest destiny or whichever way you want to put it. In some sense, but it was never articulated in a vigorous way in which uh, the Chinese national movement was. The Chinese national movement uh, talked about uh, you know, science and democracy, uh, power and prosperity. Uh, you didn't see the international leaders talk so explicitly about acquiring power was a central theme. And I think a lot of that got, shall we say, masked, I mean, masked, I don't know the right word, but uh, doused with this notions of liberal internationalism, <coughs> constructing this world order. But, but the idea that, look, India will have a big role to play, but that was quite central. And I think even if you see the, cons the constitutional assembly debates, we never talked about <coughs> India as a, as a role to play, we've got to do more things in Asia. So that theme runs through, but I think where the problem, I think, was uh, the, the mantra begins to overtake the, uh, that, that ambition, and, and, and that mantra becomes an end in itself. And I think resurrecting that in some form, that looks as by sheer weight, India is destined to play a larger role. The question is, are we ready to imagine that role today once again in a different form, in a far more credible basis today? That is the big challenge, and I think some of that, I think the last two chapters actually, are, are there constraints, are, are there possibilities, are there room? And I think the question that I've been raised, that your size, your relative weight in the international system is going to force those questions on us, that be your generation, that you've got to deal with, uh, how does India use this weight? on what form, what are the big ideas that, that we need to guide uh, India's international uh, engagement in the coming years. But that's, that is the real question. Okay, I think we're really out of time now. Uh, and and uh, let me hand over to our uh, colleague from OEP there. All right, on behalf of Oxford University Press, I thank all of you for being here this evening. We hope this discussion has brought forth various dimensions of Indian foreign policy 
a detailed overview of which is present in the handbook launched today. We are grateful to our guests of honor, Ambassador Sham Saram, Ambassador Kiyas Bajpai, and Dr. Arvind Subramanian for taking out time from their busy studio and sharing their valuable thoughts. A special thank you to the editors of the book, C. Raja Mohan, Srinath Raghavan, and of course David Malone, who couldn't be here today. The handbook is a valuable addition to our publishing program. Today's event is in collaboration with the Center for Policy Research and Observer Research Foundation, and it has always been a pleasure to be associated with them. Thank you, and may I now request everyone to join us for the outside. Thank you. I don't know. I think I've known all your predecessors going back to Anjaria, but the one.